And now won't you open your Bibles with me to the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. The most comprehensive statement of the Christian faith to be found anywhere in the Bible is in this letter to the Romans. We'll begin in chapter 1, verse 16. May we hear the infallible word of the living God. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And may God speak to us today through his holy word and may his name evermore be praised. Amen. As you may have noted over the past number of weeks, I have been dealing with some difficult questions pertaining to the Bible or to the Christian faith. And today we come to another one, which many people feel is an extremely difficult question. And that is, what about those who have never heard? Those who have never heard of Christ. Though there are two billion professing Christians in the world today, there are still those that have never even heard of Christ. Now, sometime this will be stated in a very uh, irate fashion with a serrated edge. Uh, it goes something like this. Perhaps you've heard it. Do you mean to tell me that you believe that God is going to condemn somebody for simply not believing in a Jesus Christ he never heard of? Why, that is monstrous. You probably have heard that expressed in some fashion similar to that in your lifetime. This is the ignorance defense. How could God condemn anybody if they were ignorant? Why, why that's just unconscionable for God to do that. Now, you need to remember, as I've told you before, that fallen man is always trying to carry out his agenda, which is to condemn God and justify himself. Is it monstrous to condemn somebody for ignorance, for God to do a thing like that? Well, dear friends, what about our frequent boast of our own legal system wherein we say, Ignorance of the law is no excuse. The truth of the matter is God does take into consideration ignorance. We don't. We're the monsters. So let's get the story straight. Ignorance. 
They're usually talking about the people in the midst of darkest Africa or India, China, someplace like that. Well, we've got a good bit of our share of that ignorance right here, having banished God from the classroom decades ago. We produced a whole generation of people that are almost completely biblically illiterate. For example, these are actual statements that were written by young people. In the first book of the Bible, Guinnesses, God got tired of creating and took the Sabbath off. Adam and Eve were created from an apple tree. Noah's wife was called Joan of Ark. Samson slayed the Philistines with the acts of the apostles. And the Egyptians were all drowned in the desert. Afterward, Moses went up into Mount Sinai and got the amendments. The first commandment was when Eve told Adam to eat the apple. Moses died before he ever reached Canada. And then Joshua led the Hebrews in the Battle of Jericho. <laughs> Solomon had 300 wives and 700 porcupines. <laughs> and the people who followed the Lord were the 12 decibels. And of course, the epistles were the wives of the apostles. And the greatest miracle in all of the Bible is when Joshua told his son, to stand still, and he did. Well, that would indeed be humorous, but it's really a reflection of a tragedy that we don't have to go to China or India to find biblical ignorance. We're creating it right in our own midst today. The ignorance defense. How could God condemn somebody or simply not believing something that he never heard of. Now, of course, the presupposition of that objection is the idea that these people are completely ignorant, and therefore it would not be right to condemn them for something they didn't know about. But let's question that presupposition for a moment. Are people, are any people, completely ignorant of God. Well, if you were listening carefully this morning when we read the scriptures, you will have noticed this, where it says in Romans chapter 1, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So we see that in the Bible, in numbers of places, we are told that God has revealed himself to all mankind in the light of creation. As the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his power. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth wisdom. There is no speech nor voice nor language where their voice is not heard. Everywhere around the world, when people look up at the night sky and see the vast multitude of stars twinkling in the black velvet, they realize that these were not created by any man. As the hymn writer said, the hand that made us is divine. And so it is. All over the world, people looking at the creation have come to believe in God unless their minds have been twisted and distorted by some clever philosophy of atheism or unbelief of one sort or the other. In fact, even in America, where for many decades atheistic schools have been doing their very best to destroy all belief in God, 
and produce a nation of atheists and unbelievers, still the most recent studies continue to show that 95% even of Americans believe in God. And therefore, they have the light of creation that shows them that God really does exist so that they are not ignorant of God. The second light that God has given to mankind is described in the second chapter of Romans. And that is what is called the light of conscience, creation and now conscience, where we are told that when God judges the secrets of men, their consciences and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. That God has placed a moral monitor into the hearts of men whereby they know that some things are right and other things are wrong. Now this conscience can be slowly seared as with hot iron by repeated violations, but it is never completely gone and people are guilty for the whole process of searing their own consciences. And the evidence for the conscience of man is quite plain. And in the second chapter of Romans, which deals with conscience, we have that evidence clearly set forth, where Paul says, therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest another. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doeth the very same thing, and thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest another, and doeth the same thing, that thou shalt escape the righteous judgment of God? For we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which do such things. Now, a practical example of this might be somewhere in the depths of India, let us say. A man lives in a little hut, and one day the husband comes in, and he is furious. He is all wrought up. And he says to his wife, you, you know what that, that low life, no good across the path did today? Why, why, he lied to me, just flat out lied between his teeth. He is a no good. I don't ever want to talk to him again. Now, let's run the tape forward a number of years, perhaps, until this irate husband dies. He comes before the judgment of God, and uh, God says, you are guilty of lying. And he says, what? This is a very unusual pagan in the middle of India. He speaks French. Moi? Me? Guilty of lying? Why, I didn't even know that it was wrong to lie. Now, he's got an ACLU lawyer behind him whispering in his ear, saying, tell him you never heard of the Ten Commandments. I never heard of the Ten Commandments. You see, I didn't know that it was wrong to lie. You can't condemn me for doing something that I didn't even know was wrong. And God says to one of his angels, would you play that tape back, please? And we go back a number of years and we see him storming into his hut, saying to his wife, you know what that no good across the path did to me? Why, he just plain flat out lied between his teeth. He is a no account. Now, what was it saying? Uh, you, what were you saying about the fact that you didn't know that it was wrong to lie? Thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doeth the very same thing. And so we see that the conscience is very, very clear. Another clear example of the conscience, this moral monitor that God has placed within the breast of every human, is seen in this. Perhaps here is a man that lives in one of the 
most savage islands in the South Pacific, Borneo or, or Tahiti or one of those places a hundred years ago when cannibalism was rampant. And uh, he eats people for lunch because his conscience over the years and over the years of his parents and grandparents had become so seared that no one thinks anything is wrong with eating someone for lunch. In fact, you might even invite guests over for a nice arm or thigh or whatever it is you're serving that day. And the conscience is thus seared. However, though he eats people for lunch, he steals chickens at night under the cover of darkness. Why? Because he believes and his conscience tells him that that is wrong. He also steals wives at night under the cover of darkness for the very same reason. And thus he gives clear evidence that though the conscience may be badly seared in some areas, it is still operative in others, and therefore he too is without excuse. The light of creation, the light of conscience is given to everybody on earth. God will be just. He will never be unjust. We are not endeavoring to save people from the injustice of God. We are endeavoring to save people from the justice of God, from the just deserts that they have condignly earned by their sins and thought and word and deed and omission and commission. We stand each one guilty before Almighty God. So the ignorance defense will not work. Now let me say that contrary to our law, God does take into consideration what one knows and what, what one does not know. To those who have received much, much will be required. The scripture says, we will not be judged about what we don't know, we will be judged about what we do know. As one famous founder of this country once said, the thing that disturbed him was not what he didn't understand about the Bible, but what disturbed him is what he did understand about it, and uh, in which his heart and mind and conscience convicted him because he knew that he was guilty. And so therefore, God will be absolutely just. And you see, my friends, that is our problem. If you have a just judge in this world, that will be a problem if you are guilty. If you are a criminal and have been apprehended and hauled before this judge, you will not be happy to have a just judge. You would like one that will fudge a bit and maybe wink and let you off for a little payment later on. But the judge of all the earth must do rightly. So there is our problem. Now the third light is found in the third chapter of the book of Romans. And it is not the light of creation, nor the light of conscience, but it is the light of Christ. It is the light of the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, who came into this world to take all of our guilt, all of our sins upon himself, and to endure the outpouring of the wrath of God that we deserve in our place. That is the light of Christ, it is the light of grace, and it is not incumbent upon God to extend it to everyone. Let us make it very clear, it is not incumbent upon God to extend it to anyone. 
The great Charles Spurgeon said, the amazing thing is not that everybody isn't saved, the amazing thing is that anybody is saved. A judge must be just, but he doesn't have to pardon any criminal. And should he or a king or a president or a governor pardon any criminal, that is no reason why he must pardon all criminals. As God has said, Christ has said, is it not right for me to do what I will with what is my own? Grace is not owed to anyone. Otherwise, it very simply is not grace. It is debt. God may have mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he wills, he hardens. And so therefore, the light of Christ is not extended to everyone, but is to be offered to the whole world. And thus we see the exclusivity of the gospel, but also its inclusiveness as well because no one is kept out because of his race or color, because of his social status, because of his education or lack of it. Everyone is invited to come. There is no difference. All may come and find mercy at the hands of Christ. But because God extends it to some does not mean that he must extend it to, to any other. He must be just. He doesn't have to be gracious or merciful to any guilty sinner. Any more than we would rejoice if the governor, having released one criminal in Florida, should decide that next week he is going to empty the prisons in the state of Florida and you will be living with all of those murderers and rapists and child molesters and all of the rest, they're all gonna be dumped right into society. I guarantee you there would be a huge outcry. So therefore, the idea that God owes to everyone some offer of mercy is totally foreign from the Bible. And the idea that there is an ignorance defense, the folly of that and the fallacy of it can see, be seen if we apply a little logic to it. For example, turn the tape of the world's history backward. Today there are two billion plus professing Christians. Go back 2,000 years and there, were, there was none. So you see, if we go backward, we find that nobody knew the gospel and therefore the offer of mercy had not yet been offered to anyone at all. And in that case, if it is merely true that to be ignorant of the gospel is sufficient to allow you admission into heaven, Remember the objection, you don't mean to tell me that you believe that God is going to condemn someone who never heard of the gospel of Christ 2,000 years ago, nobody heard of it. Therefore, ergo, they all will be admitted into heaven, according to that logic. So, we find that when Christ was born, the whole world was on its way to heaven. Then Jesus came. And millions of people are going to hell. Consequently, we must conclude that Jesus Christ is not the greatest, most wonderful, most marvelous person that ever lived. He is the greatest malefactor that the world has ever seen, the greatest evildoer. He came into a world that was saved and has succeeded in sending millions or billions to hell. Ah, my friends, that's just not the way the facts are. The whole world layeth in the hands of the evil one. Darkness covered the earth. All of mankind was lost in sin. And then the glad tidings came. And then the angel proclaimed good tidings, for unto you is born a Savior, 
which is Christ the Lord. No, when you take the just, the ignorance defense and run it backward, it ends up in total chaos. Or run the tape forward. If you think that evangelism explosion, for example, one I'm fairly familiar with, is a good program for winning the world to Christ, let me tell you of a far better one. Now this far better one is based upon the presuppositions of the ignorance defense. Simply fire all the preachers, close all the churches, burn all of the Bibles and all other religious books, and in a couple of generations nobody will know about Christ and everybody will be saved. We haven't done that in 2,000 years. Isn't that a wonderful plan? We'll call that evangelism implosion. Obviously, the folly of that speaks very loudly to the error of the ignorance defense. If indeed man is sinful, which not only every religion attests, but the Bible declares from the very beginning, and the only hope we have is a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now there are Christians, even, in addition to the skeptics and atheists of all kinds, who would like to say, you mean to tell me that God is going to condemn someone for simply not believing in a Jesus he never heard of, there are even Christians that will make the same objection. Now, they won't express it in such a sawtoothed fashion, but nevertheless, the same objection has been heard. I heard it expressed at the World Congress on Evangelism in Berlin by a noted Christian minister. Why would Christians say a thing like that? Well, to get the answer to that question, as with so many other moral questions, all you need to do is just remember that we are sinful, fallen creatures. It is far easier to simply declare that all people who are ignorant are going to go to heaven, ignorant of the gospel. It's far easier to declare that than it is to declare that they are lost and apart from Christ without hope because it is then our responsibility to tell them. But if we can simply declare that since they are ignorant, they are going to go to heaven because of that ignorance, we certainly wouldn't want to enlighten them. And that takes care of that. And let me tell you, millions of church members would be a whole lot more comfortable with that theology because it allows them to sit on their sofa and do nothing at all and they will feel perfectly at ease because after all, they're going to be all right, aren't they? Ah, dear friend, Jesus Christ declared, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And those that believe shall be saved and those that do not will be everlastingly condemned. And the responsibility rests with us. You remember the story about, and this is fiction, about the time that Christ returned from his journey to this earth, gathered together all of the angels and archangels and told them about this great adventure that he had had, about his birth in a stable, about the life that he had lived, the humble life of poverty, about his teaching, about the fact 
that his disciples betrayed him, his countrymen turned against him, the religious leaders condemned him, and he was skewered to a cross whereon he endured the agony of the damned. And then having died the third day, he rose again from the dead, and he appeared to his disciples over and over and over again, and he told them to go and based upon what he had accomplished, proclaim to the world that those that trust in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And what a glorious story that is. And then you remember in this fictional account that one of the younger angels, of which there are none, raised his hand and said, but, but Lord, what if they don't do that? What if they don't go and tell the world of what you've done? What is your backup program? And Christ said, I have none. The responsibility rests with us. May we pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that your spirit will give us a clear vision of the plight of the lost, those who are on their way to eternal perdition, to damnation forever, and that we might experience something of the burden upon our hearts to take the glorious glad tidings that there is a way in which they may find forgiveness and pardon and even the free gift of eternal life in paradise. O oh God, may we not shirk our responsibility and our glorious opportunity to be the bearers of everlasting good tidings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. This has been a production of Truth in Action Ministries.